Greetings. Today is the 22nd Sunday after Trinity, 13th of November, 2022. This service was pre-recorded on Friday the 11th. Participating in this service are reader, video photographer, Shane Donnelly, and myself. Beginning today and continuing all day Monday, the altar will be decorated for the harvest. If in the area, we invite you to attend our annual Thanksgiving Eve service, Wednesday, the 23rd of November at 7 p.m. Guest harpist, Jingyi Jang, and guest vocalist, Joanne McFarlane, will perform. Shane Donnelly will give the message. Optional child care is available. A pie social will follow the worship. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day. You like donuts? Every Sunday morning at Sunday school, we have donuts, all kinds of donuts. And do you know how they make a donut? This is a donut cutter, kind of like a cookie cutter, but note in the middle, there's a circle. So when they press the cookie cutter on the, on the dough, it leaves a hole and they take that hole and of course, now people call them a munchkin, but it is taken and thrown into a kettle of oil and fried. And of course, that hole in the center fries the donut completely. Now, let's look at the donut. There's an old rhyme, maybe you've heard it. As you go through life, make this your goal Look at the donut and not the hole. Say that again. As you go through life, make this your goal. Look at the donut and not the hole. Now, what does that mean? It means that many people, when they approach life, they're not looking at the things they have, like the donut. They're looking at what they don't have, that center. And that it's difficult when you're looking at what you don't have, rather than appreciating what you do have, to be a thankful person. And this Thanksgiving, as we approach this holiday, all of us need to stop and think, why are we thankful? Why we should be thankful? And, and if you're looking at the whole things that you don't have, maybe, maybe you're an individual and, and you don't have a computer, but you wish that you did. Well, you're looking at the whole. There's other things that you do have. All right, or maybe you're looking at friends and they have a big, beautiful home and each child has his own bedroom and they get all the designer clothes and they have name brand shoes, all kinds of things that you, you can't have because your family can't afford it. You're looking at what they have, but what you don't have, you feel that you're missing out, you're short change. Take thought, there are things that you have that other people do not have. Believe me, you do. That's, that's why we need to reflect 
at Thanksgiving. There, there are many things that we have that other people don't have. And one thing that I have that I'm appreciative, I don't have any children, but I have you as the children of this church. So I am grateful. So that is what we need to be focusing on this Thanksgiving season. Don't keep looking at, at the whole, what you don't have, look at what you do have. And this is what the Apostle Paul tells us in the Bible. These are, are well-known words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for it is the will of Christ Jesus for you. People often say, how can I know the will of God? Well, we can know the will of God by being thankful. If we start being thankful, God's going to make his will known to us. So l let us be thankful. It's been a difficult year. It's been a year of sickness, people uh, maybe not working, uh, schools shut down, all kinds of difficulties. But there have been many blessings this past year, and, and we need to stop and think about them, and, and we need to let God know that we are a thankful people. And what I'm giving you this week as your gift, I'm giving you banners that you can spell Happy Thanksgiving. So you have a happy Thanksgiving, and I will see you next weekend. For this week's scripture, I am reading from the Revised Standard Version Bible. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. I will start in chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. The Sending of the Seventy. After this, the Lord appointed seventy others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to come. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag no sandals, and salute no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be with this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on that day of Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable in the judgment of Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you will be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Then he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, 
but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. Imagine being informed by a doctor that you have a terminal disease and with only six months to live. What do you do with your allotment of time? Don't give me the wise crack, see another doctor and get a second opinion. International surveys have been taken, and if nearing the end of life, the number one ambition by the responders is travel. With the top destinations to see, the pyramids of Egypt, take an Alaskan cruise, go on an African safari, walk the Great Wall of China, or fly to Dubai. Additional bucket list aspirations include skydiving, white water rafting, zip lining, being a contestant on a TV game show, or a hot air balloon ride. WWJD, what would Jesus do? When reading the episode in the life of our good Lord, it is valuable to place an event on a timeline. The internal evidence of the Gospels informs us that three years into his public ministry, our blessed Lord, with six months before the Good Friday crucifixion, commissioned the 70. On the road headed for Jerusalem, where he knew a cross awaited him, the Son of God, with a recognition of the shortness of time, planned an intensified preaching campaign. Thirty-five teams of disciples were dispatched to various towns and cities, earmarked for a later visitation by Jesus. Arrangements for lodging and meals, reserving sites for public gatherings, and advanced publicity for the arrival of the Lord were to be handled by the pair of men. Luke is the only gospel writer to make mention of the Seventy. The New International Version reads 72, whereas the King James and the Revised Standard say 70. Why the discrepancy? Scholars differ in their interpretations. The ancient church tradition is the 70, where a secondary view, popular with modern-day Bible translators, is 72. The dominant view of the Church, Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox, is to go with the 70. And supporting this perspective is the Old Testament precedent. Jesus was connecting his action with previous scriptural use of 70. After the flood of Noah, the earth was repopulated by his sons and their wives, creating 70 nations. With 70 people groups on the planet, Christ launched this beginning of a global enterprise by giving marching orders to the 70 missionaries to carry the good news. Another support for 70 is a symbolic action. 70 is 7 times 10, both numbers with a spiritual meaning in Holy Writ. Moses was the leader of Israel. He picked 70 elders to assist him with the burden of administrative duties. The 70 elders gave rise to the formation of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Judaism. The church is the new Israel with the 12 apostles and the 70 parallel, the 70 elders. According to 1 Corinthians, 15.6, the risen Lord appeared to a body of 500 believers. A group of 120 met in the upper room in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting after the ascension, receiving the empowerment of the promised Holy Spirit. It is assumed that 70 are among these latter statistics. From the early days of Christianity, a few of the Church Fathers created lists, supplying identities of the Seventy, and not always in agreement with some of the names. 
The compilations hold value for they explain the status of the big names we meet up with in the Apostolic Church. For example, Mark and Luke are not among the Twelve Apostles, but regarded as with the Seventy, upholding their legitimacy as an eyewitness author of the Gospels. Reading of the missionary journeys and the epistles of St. Paul, we encounter his traveling entourage, Barnabas, Silas, Aristarchus, Sophanes, Titus, Trophimus, and Tychicus. Who were they and where did they come from? These companions of the Johnny-come-lately Apostle Paul were of the Seventy and able to fill him in with information concerning the Master. These claims cannot be substantiated, but do supply some plausible explanation about the rapid rise of the Christian religion and the formation of the New Testament writings. Before Billy Graham held a crusade in a major metropolis, he sent a support staff a year in advance to lay the groundwork. Christ is doing much the same. We do not know the time lapse between the send-off of the Seventy and their return, but it had to be under half a year. The Seventy were not volunteers or chosen by lottery, but personally appointed by the Lord with an assignment looked upon by him as on-the-job training. After this episode, we never hear about them again. Returning to ecclesiastical tradition, the ancient fathers posited that after the resurrection, the Seventy moved out in pairs as church planters to the four corners of the Roman Empire. This claim helps us to understand how a small band in Jerusalem took off so quickly to emerge as a dominant religious movement. Jesus made a statement that he had preached, taught, and performed miracles in the towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida with absolutely no impact upon the residents. Nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do we read any record about Christ's stay in Chorazin. The Lord made a passing mention of Capernaum and that his ministry yielded puny results. Capernaum was the hometown of the fishermen, Peter and Andrew and James and John. The community served as a headquarters for the beginning of Christ's ministry after his baptism for a year. The inclusion of the Lord's preaching tour at Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum reminds us that there is so much about Jesus' life which is unknown. The fourth Gospel of John concludes that if everything Jesus said and did were to be written down, there would not be enough shelf space in the libraries of the world to hold the books. Popular Christian author Max Lucado, in his Christmas book, God Came Near, has a chapter entitled, 25 Questions for Mary. Among them, Mary, did you ever scold Jesus? Mary, how did he act when he got his first haircut? Mary, did Jesus ever come home with a black eye? We have more questions than we do answers about Jesus, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, and the wise men. And the teaching passed down to us that in the transmission of the sacred writings, the original authors were guided by the Spirit of God as to what to put down in print and what was to be left out. If it is important to you to know if Jesus had blue, green, brown, or black eyes, you'll get the answer when you see him face to face in heaven. Make sure that you see him in heaven. Another instructive point 
can be made about the poor response of the three towns of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Jesus Christ is the grand teacher, the teacher extraordinaire, and the teacher of teachers. He was ineffective in getting through to these city dwellers, but he went gangbusters elsewhere. If the Lord encountered closed minds, cold hearts, and resistant spirits, we too can expect to face an inability to hit a home run with every crowd and maybe not even to make it the first base. Some individuals, communities, and even regions are not receptive to the gospel, while others are more inclined. Doing ministry in the Sun Belt is not the same as the Rust Bowl. Southern California is not South Dakota. Newcastle, Delaware is not Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And Neshanic Township is not Neshanic Village. The slim pickings of a harvest Jesus reached at Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum stand as a reminder that we should not beat ourselves up asking, what are we doing wrong? It just may be that we are up against an entrenched mindset of a locale, hampering outreach. Did you take note of Jesus' instruction for packing? Travel light. If the average American were to go on a short-term mission trip, he or she would need a U-Haul. Cell phone, laptop, sunscreen, insect repellent, first aid kit, flashlight, batteries, umbrella, bottled water, sleeping bag, several complete changes of clothing, plus a wallet of cash, international checks, and credit cards. Consider the wisdom of the master. Simplicity. If the message of the evangelist is taken to the unsaved, and he is telling them to put their trust in God to supply all their needs, how can he lip-sing with Christy Lane one day at a time, sweet Jesus, when he has a stockpile of goods to last a family of four for a year? Is the minister practicing what he's preaching? If the traveling preacher pulls in the town in a Mercedes chariot wearing a Botany 500 caftan and flashes a Rolex watch, the local yokels may perceive that he is one rich dude, making him a target for robbery, or a pastor with a soft touch who can be manipulated by a sad story to hand over the mullah. And if this man of the cloth exudes wealth and prosperity, the unconverted may suspect that he is a fly-by-night Elmer Gantry on the make, trying to get his hands into their wallets and pocketbooks. The demand of the Lord downsize. Jesus of Nazareth had more to say about the acquisition of riches and the collection of worldly goods than any other topic. Poverty is a big problem. Wealth is a bigger problem. Our insatiable craving for more and more and the newer, bigger and better consumer goods has spawned uncontrollable greed and corruption, resulting in our current economic crisis. As I get older, I have arrived at a situation where I need less and less to live on. Most of my personal resources are invested doing good for others to live out their faith. When the economy collapses sooner, not later, Many of the people of God are going to confront monumental difficulties because all they ever wanted was everything and will find themselves forced to do without. Can we just learn to say no? We will be in a better spiritual state when we can free ourselves from the weight 
of excess baggage. Accumulation is a tyranny over us. Has technology made all of our lives better? Speed and convenience are not spiritual and moral values. The Lord established priorities with the seven. What kind of headway is he making with us? Six cities are emphasized in these 20 verses. Sodom, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tar, Sidon, and Capernaum. Before the gospel was taken to the farmlands on the outback of the Mediterranean world, it was introduced to the urban population centers. The majority of the epistles by St. Paul were addressed to cities, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, and Ephesians. Earmarked to focus on the cities, the 70 were instructed by Jesus that a rejection of them was a rejection of himself and ultimately a rejection of God the Father. Shaking the dirt off one's shoes and moving on should not be understood as a sign of contempt. To hold this to be the meaning runs contrary to the character of Christ. In the 1958 movie musical South Pacific by Rodgers and Hammerstein, Mitzi Gaynor sang, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair and send him on his way. What is Mitzi implying? She had to cleanse herself of the detrimental effects a boyfriend had upon her life. Take hold of this idea. When confronting negativity, don't carry the dirt with you to the next town. Telling everybody how rotten the inhabitants were, shake off and release the crud. Move on with your life. Jesus is saying we cannot allow unbelief and rejection to cling to us and soil our thinking and behavior. For a community to have the opportunity to embrace Christ and to dismiss him is to announce its own doom. The Barna Research Institute is a national scientific survey company like the Gallup Poll, but its findings are limited to religion. According to Barna, the most unchurched city in the country is Albany, the capital of New York, with 60% of its population completely detached from organized religion. Pittsburgh is ranked number 37 of the 100 U.S. cities, with 40% of its people without any affiliation with a community of faith. The unchurched category is determined by a number of factors, including claims of atheism, lack of Bible reading, worship attendance, donations and volunteerism, the frequency of prayer. During the early 1980s, Darren Knappen, former associate pastor at First Baptist Church in Newcastle, sought the cooperation of the clergy to compile the religious demographics of Lawrence County. According to Knappen, over half the population had no connection with a congregation. And of course, that was 40 years ago. The number continues to grow. Did you know that Detroit, Michigan is now classified as a third world city. The average pastor in Motown has a gun at the pulpit and ushers are armed due to the prevalence of robberies. Churches do not schedule any evening activities. It is unsafe. When are we going to wake up and see the cause and effect relationship 
Because of our rejection of our Judeo-Christian heritage with its faith and values, we witness the disintegration of our cities. With his commission, Christ authorized the 70 to perform physical healings. No directive was made to cast out demons. Upon return, the 70 made no report of healings, but shared an elation that they had conducted successful exorcisms. This was an unexpected byproduct of obedience. When we step out in faith, saturated in prayer, the end results will exceed our expectations. The Lord declared, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Lightning is commonly connected with a devil in pop culture. The association of Lucifer with lightning is based upon this verse, but it does not suggest that old neck is electrifying and lights up the sky. Lightning, thunder, and earthquakes in the Bible accompany the presence, power, and judgment coming from God. Our understanding that Satan fell like lightning is the proclamation by Christ that with the 70 cent on their mission, Jesus saw a vision. The kingdom of darkness was dealt a punch. Traveling on, trampling on scorpions and serpents is not an invitation to join a snake handling cult in West Virginia, but a reminder that if God gives us a work to do, he will supply us with everything needed to carry out our task with no harm. Poisonous snakes and stinging scorpions were a constant fear among the peoples of the biblical world. Jesus is telling his team, do not allow deadly critters to stop you from doing what you are called to do. God will see to it that you are protected. A man received his first computer delivered by UPS. Eagerly reading the manual, he proceeded to connect the wires, flipped on the switch, but nothing happened. Totally frustrated with this newfangled contraption, his little daughter walked over and remarked, Daddy, can I plug it in for you? Christ alerts us that we must have a source of power, prayer. The harvest is great, the workers are few. And to overcome this disparity, attention must be assigned to prayer. Pray not only for decisions to be made for Christ, but for laborers. Billy Graham said that the three most important words in the Christian walk are, pray, pray, pray. When interviewed, the Prince of Preachers was questioned that if he had to do his ministry over again, what would he do differently? And without hesitation, Billy emphatically shared, spend more time in prayer. No one is a firmer believer in the power of prayer than the devil. Not that he practices it, he suffers from it. Are we losing our spiritual battles because we are not prayer conditioned? The nearby Grove City College is a citadel of conservative Protestantism in this nation. Its faculty are consulted by national media for their perspectives. Professor David Gordon wrote a book entitled The Decline of Christianity in the West, A Contrarian View. Gordon posits that Christians look to the White House Congress and the Supreme Court to set the tone for society and to make Christianity flourish. Is our rise or fall determined by political powers? According to Gordon, the church is in trouble because it is lacking credible, competent, spiritual, and moral leadership to rally us, to inspire us, and to direct us. Today, Pastors, congregations, ministries, and denominations are facing untold internal 
discord because the political polarity of the nation has infiltrated the body of Christ, dividing the family of God, destroying our witness and distracting us from our mission. Shouldn't we as Christians be concerned by big political issues of our time? Concerned, yes, but not consumed by them. Among the reasons youth share as to why they have a disdain for the institutional church is the ranting and anger from Christian leaders, left and right, demonizing those with differing viewpoints. The Apostle Paul in chapter 4 of Ephesians reminds us that there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Now the pulpit bullies insist there is only one political opinion. Why are the people of God engaging in spitting matches over these matters? I personally know Christians, formerly friends, now do not talk to each other over the outcome of the last presidential election. Note their dismay with one another is not grounded in false doctrine, heresy, and immorality, but politically on opposite ends of the aisle. Are we primarily a Republican or a Democrat who happens to be a Christian? My primary identity and foremost allegiance is that of a Christian. God is not a Republican or a Democrat, nor is he an independent. He has his own agenda and be assured that it will ultimately prevail over the best plans of mice and men. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, the call of our hour is to keep the main thing the main thing. Here with repetition, the Lord Jesus Christ stressed to the 70 that they were to announce to every hamlet and town they entered the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God. He's coming for you and me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.